Okay, ladies and gentlemen, moving on uh, this morning. So our next speaker is Gibran Alberto Gomez Montes, and he's here for you. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, so thanks uh, for coming. Uh, my name is Gibran Gomez, and I'm uh, part of the IMDA Software Institute in Madrid. Uh, we do research on uh, blockchain, mostly on Bitcoin, and also uh, of malware. Uh, this talk is uh, titled uh, Carved in Stone, Malware Abuse of the Bitcoin Blockchain. And this is part of some research work we did uh, with uh, our team in IMDEA, Juan Caballero, Pedro Moreno, and Kevin uh, Van Liebergen. Um, so, uh, first of all, um, I think we everybody knows uh, Bitcoin, right, as a payment channel. Uh, it can be used uh, to produce uh, some payments like very easily, right? It is uh, pseudonymous. Uh, it is public and decentralized, and it's also very, uh, it's unregulated in a lot of countries, right? So this, all these properties are like uh, very good for privacy, but also will uh, attract a lot of uh, cybercrime, right? Um, uh, so I will recap just a bit how it uh, goes, right? Bitcoin transactions are like this. You have, uh, you just need an address that's, the pseudo-anonymous part, right? You can produce this address from your uh, local computer or by just going to a, a third-party service like an exchange, pay with some cash, and get some coins, right? So after doing this payment, uh, the, the exchange will produce a deposit to your wallet, to your Bitcoin address, and this will be stored on the blockchain like uh, for life, right? It's like... Um, that's why it's carved on stone. So you can then produce some withdrawals using your address that, yeah, by producing some transactions that will also be stored on the blockchain, right? Uh, we will see uh, that this uh, payment channel attract a lot of cybercrime, right? Uh, we will see uh, mainly two types of cybercrime. The first one that it's more common for everybody, it's uh, as a payment channel. Uh, for instance, by uh, setting up uh, illegal services, right? Like, for instance, the Silk Road uh, marketplace or uh, services for money laundering. Uh, also extortion, several types of extortion. For instance, we have in the last years a very uh, widespread uh, way of extorting people called uh, sextortion. Uh, maybe you also receive these uh, spam emails that say that they have some compromising information about you and they ask some amount of bitcoins uh, in order to not releasing this information, right? Uh, it is also a scam, so don't pay. Uh, in this category also we have uh, ransomware, that it's a type of malware, right? Everybody knows about it. Uh, that it's encrypting your files and then asking for a uh, for a payment to release your data, right? Uh, not only that, but in the last years, also ransomware is uh, using this double extortion scheme that uh, will make you pay another fee for not releasing your data, like on the web, right? Um, we have seen a lot of uh, thefts, like of exchanges, of users, of wallets, whatever and uh, also in the form of scams, right? Not like sextortion, but also like investment scams or uh, romance scams, whatever. Uh, we have seen also uh, stealing computer, computing power, uh, for instance, by installing a malware that will use your, your PC to mine some cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, but not only, just uh, a part of it mine Bitcoin now mostly uh, crypto jacking, malware, uh, mine Monero, right? But we will focus in this talk um, in the other type of abuse we have seen in our research. Uh, it's about data propagation, right? So the properties of Bitcoin make it like a very resilient mechanism for storing data and to propagate it, right? Because it's decentralized, it's, it's public. So you don't need to ask anybody to store some information on the blockchain. 
right? Uh, we have seen two types of this, um, this type of abuse, that it's uh, command and control signaling used by malware botnets, and also to release keys uh, to victims of uh, ransomware attacks, right? We will uh, see more uh, about it. So, as I said, ransomware, prob most probably everybody knows it. Uh, they will encrypt your data, make you pay, and this will produce a transaction on the blockchain, right? This payment to the, to the payment address of the ransomware gang. So this will be stored on the blockchain, and we will do some analysis on these transactions produced by victims, right? Uh, just a quick reminder, these transactions most probably will be produced by a service, right? Because uh, ransomware gangs are attacking people that most probably don't have any bitcoins. So this will be important for the analysis. Another malware threat that it's not like very well known is called a clipper, right? A clipper is a very simple piece of code that will uh, monitor the operating system clipboard, right? So if you have a clipper installed, it will search for clip uh, for Bitcoin addresses in your clipboard and will replace those addresses with uh, one of their own. So, for instance, imagine you want to make a payment to address A, and uh, you will typically uh, copy the address into your clipboard and then paste it into your client or your web page uh, of the exchange for producing this uh, transaction, right? So the clipper, if you have infected, um, if you have an infected machine, then the clipper will replace this on the clipboard, and if you're not careful enough, you will end in uh, like paying to address C instead of address A, right? So it's uh, very simple, but it's still, it, uh, it still is a lot of money. Um, so in the data propagation category, we have uh, command and control signaling. Uh, since 2016 or 17, I guess, uh, malware is using this, uh, uh, these mechanisms to, to put some information on the, on the blockchain, right? To let all the botnet know which is the next location of the command and control server. And it's a very simple way to do that. There is a special type of, uh, of address called an op return address, right? That mm, will store a small amount of information on it. So this small amount of information will also be stored in the blockchain, right? So uh, malware will uh, leverage that. For instance, this is Glubteva malware. It uh, takes uh, the, the domain name uh, of the command and control server, then it encrypts uh, this domain name, this is string, using an uh, IES uh, protocol, and then they store this value into an op return address, right? Then this will propagate through the uh, Bitcoin uh, nodes, and then will be stored on the in, on the blockchain, right? And uh, in order to retrieve this data, the bots just uh, need to go to a third-party service called uh, Blockchain Explorer, like, for instance, blockchain.info, that it's very popular. Uh, this type of services just parse all the, all the blockchain and put all the transactions on the web, right? So you have all the addresses and the transactions and that on the, on the web format. And uh, the bots just need, like, to make a request to this service uh, asking, hey, give me all the transactions of this address, right? And then with the last transaction, it will use the AES key it has embedded to decrypt the value of the op return and then connect to the, to the command and control, right? So who can stop that? Uh, what can we do? It's uh, blockchain analysis, right? We have the blockchain, we have all the transactions stored that in there, um, we have both the deposits and the withdrawals of all the addresses we have. So we can uh, produce a graph using this, all this information, right? Uh, for instance, the one on your left, it's a deposit. So we can produce a graph 
using the, the seed address, that is the address we want to analyze. Uh, the square is the transaction and the circles are other addresses, right? That are interacting with this, with our seed. On the, on the right, we have a withdrawal that it's basically the same, but we have the seed address uh, sending funds to other addresses, right? Probably using also other unspent transaction outputs uh, to complete the amount uh, that he wants to send. So for doing this analysis, we will need uh, uh, some things, right? For instance, we will need tags. Tags are just pieces of information that we can collect from the public internet uh, that identify addresses with owners, right? For instance, we have one address that we saw in a ransom note. Then we can tag this like, hey, this address belongs to Deadbolt or whatever. Right. We also can uh, go to some services that publish addresses of exchanges or gambling sites or marketplaces and uh, collect all those addresses in order to detect when there are a change of ownership. Right. Because when we are doing this type of analysis, um, we need to know like where the, the money go. Right. Uh, for this, we produce a platform for automating this analysis. So if we put this, all these transactions of this address together, we can produce this kind of graphs. Uh, and then we can do like the same over and over, right? Like do it recursively. We can do again the same procedure with the address we found, like in the withdrawal and take all the transactions it has and then do it again with all the addresses and so on until we find a change of ownership, right? That's why we need tax. So this is uh, what previous works do. It, uh, it's called forward tracing because they take an address and then look for all the withdrawals and then these addresses, all the withdrawals and so on. So it's like going forwards, right? Like following the money trace. And uh, it's like a very well-known technique. Uh, it has some limitations though. Because, uh, for instance, uh, what if we want to go backwards instead, right? Uh, it's like very simple idea, but it's not so easy to implement because uh, we will uh, we need to detect like very good uh, change of ownership, or we will just end up with a with a graph explosion, right? Um, so we will work on this. Um, yeah, we, we have worked on this platform. We're still developing. Uh, we use tags for detecting change of ownership, but don't, not only, right? Because tags are like very limited. We have just a few tags for millions of Bitcoin addresses. So uh, to solve this problem, we trained an exchange classifier also to detect uh, change of ownership and some other heuristics that allows us like to cut the graph when we detect this change of ownership. So we just uh, produce the graph of the operation, for instance, of a ransomware operation or some malware using uh, Bitcoin for command and control uh, signaling. Uh, this is very useful in the, in the case of the command and control signaling because uh, when, when the malware is signaling uh, the next location of the command and control, it will spend money producing transactions, right? So at the end of the day, the money will end. There will be no money in the wallet, and then they will replenish money on the wallet. Uh, so for instance, the forward tracing will find uh, nothing, no service there, because the money just will gone, right? Uh, that's why we wanted to explore also backwards to see if we were able to to see which addresses or which, which services were depositing, injecting money to the operation, right? We use this as attribution points because uh, in several countries, exchanges are regulated, right? So they need to comply with the know your customer policies. And um, 
so they need to, to collect information about their clients, right? So if uh, malware is using an exchange for injecting money to the operation, then uh, eventually they need to register an account, and so it's a, a possible attribution point, right? Uh, we also do this back, backward analysis from services that uh, are designed to, to obfuscate the, the money flow, right? For instance, mixers. So from a mixer, you cannot go forwards because it's like uh, it produces mixing transactions. So you can do the other way around, right? You can go backwards and see who are like injecting money into the into the mixer? These are just use cases of uh, the backwards analysis. Uh, another thing we do with this uh, type of graphs is um, like analyzing all the addresses that are uh, connected each other and uh, see if there are more addresses that behave the same way of the, of the command and control signaling addresses, right? For this, we use operation oracles. Um, in some sense, oracles are just classifiers, right? Uh, you have a set of transactions that produced uh, by an address. Uh, you have this input to the, to the oracle, and then the oracle will say, hey, this address uh, behaves exactly like Glupteva or exactly like a uh, server or whatever. We have produced uh, four of these oracles in uh, our previous works. Uh, most of them are uh, command and control signaling uh, operations that use uh, withdrawals from the, from the addresses to, to, to do the signaling, right? There is... Um, a very funny case, uh, in the case of Pony and the skid map, they were using deposits instead of, of withdrawals. And uh, I mean, if you remember the deposits and the withdrawals transactions, a deposit, anybody can deposit to an address, right? So if you are using deposits to signaling the next location of the command and control server, then somebody can do deposits for you and then redirect all the botnet to, to another server, right? Uh, so that's, why, uh, that's what uh, Taniguchi et al. did in some paper and they reported how they take over the, the pony uh, botnet. Uh, so this is a server's oracle. We have uh, the address uh, C that it's the, the command and control signaling address that will produce a transaction, a deposit to, to a disposable address D. And then disposable address D will just send back the money to, to C, right? Uh, the, the botnet will ask for all the transactions of C and will uh, we'll see, hey, transaction one is sent to D. Let's take the six first characters of D and add dot top TLD, and we have the, the, the domain name of the next command and control, right? When they want to change the domain name, they will do the same, another address, take the six first characters, and then do it again and again to, to produce like domain names uh, almost randomly. Uh, this is uh, a graph we produced using uh, our tool. We were able to find uh, three previously unknown signaling addresses from uh, four seats, if I remember correctly. Uh, you can see the graph. Uh, it's like kind of evident where the command and control uh, signaling addresses are, right? Those like large circles uh, are producing just these loops of one transaction and receiving back all the money. That's why they look like this. And then it has some interactions between the command and control addresses also. Um, so this is very interesting because we are seeing addresses behaving the same and also addresses that transact between each other, right? So this is like strong evidence. This is the same operation. And that's what we wanted to show. Um, 
In the case of Pony and Skidmap, it, uh, the, the Oracle looks like this, right? You have uh, an address D that is the disposable address that will produce a deposit to, to address P that it's the command and control signaling that the bot will, will search on the, on the blockchain explorers. And then it, uh, D produces another transaction. So it will produce two transactions every time to signal an IP address. Uh, so you take the, the value of the first transaction and uh, transform this to hexadecimal and then just split uh, the hexadecimal into two parts and then transform again to decimal, right? So in this way you have two octets of an IP. With the second value, the second uh, transaction, you do the same and then you will end with the, the other two octets of the IP. You just arrange these octets uh, in the correct way and you will have the IP of the command and control server. Uh, this uh, protocol is used by two families, though we don't know if there are like the same uh, malware authors or not because the graphs are not connected. Um, this is the resulting graph of Pony. Uh, we were able to find eight previously unknown signaling addresses in here, so producing also uh, IPs of uh, command and control servers. And also going backwards, we were able to find one attribution point, so one exchange depositing funds to the, to the operation. And this was a very good result uh, because as I said, if you go forwards, you will never find any attribution point just going backwards. Uh, you can see the, the, like the production the command and control signaling addresses, the one on the top that was like very active producing uh, uh, transactions. And we have others on the, on the sites that we think were used to, like, to test the system and to change, um, uh, yeah, to update the systems and that. This is the results of Skidmap. Uh, we were able to find one relation with other malware in this graph that we think it's the, a previous version of Skidmap. Um, and also three attribution points like in the same way, right? Like going backwards, we found the malware, then going forwards, we found the attribution points so we can attribute, uh, at least in theory, uh, this operation uh, with three different exchanges. Uh, this is Glupteva. Um, it's, uh, it's the one I was talking about a few minutes ago. We have uh, an address G that will produce a transaction like with this special op return uh, field on it with, that will contain the, the encrypted uh, string that will be the, the domain name. So it will just produce this type of transactions again and again to produce new, new domain names, right? Uh, these are the two graphs we found, like uh, two different components that indicate that they were using like two, like two addresses like simultaneously. And uh, yeah, we also found other previously, un previously unknown uh, signaling addresses here. Um, yeah, so now uh, the deadbolt case is like uh, very interesting because a deadbolt is a ransomware, right? That was infecting uh, NAS devices. So a NAS device is uh, public to the internet, right? It was infected uh, and then when the, when the victim pays, the, the ransomware authors will like produce a transaction that uh, will also be stored on the blockchain with the, the, the key for the decryption of, of, the, of the data of the victim, right? Uh, so the victim just need to go to some blockchain explorer and see the same payment address and see the next transaction and this will have their key right, for decrypting their system. So the interesting thing is that uh, 
because the NAS servers were public at some point, uh, the internet scanners were able to, to detect some of uh, infected devices, right? Because the, the attack uh, replaced the, the front page of the NAS with a ransom note, right? Saying something about uh, we encrypt your data, pay, and that. Uh, so we did some uh, we did some queries to to these uh, internet scanners to see if we were able to to reach some of these uh, victims NAS devices. Uh, we found some of them. Uh, we just used them to compare our techniques of discovering more addresses with uh, those that were able to find by, by internet scanners. Um, this is the Oracle of Deadbolt, right? So as I said, the victim will produce the first transaction to the payment address. Uh, the payment address is P. The victim will pay 0.03 or 0.05 Bitcoins to it. And then right after this, uh, the, the uh, malware authors will produce transaction two using the address uh, K uh, that will have three outputs. The first one will be a very small payment to, to the same address P, the address uh, where the victim uh, paid. The other is an up return with the, with the key for the victim in, in an up return field. And the third output will be like all the money returning to the same address key, right? Because uh, you need to spend all your money in the transaction, so you need a change address, right? And this was like very easy way, just return all the money to K. Right, so the interesting thing here is that uh, by seeing transaction two, we know that K is um, delivering keys to victims, right? So we went to K and asked for all the transactions of K to see if we were able to, to, to find more victims. And in fact, we did. Um, not only that, but just uh, uh, also remember the Dutch police did some uh, a very interesting uh, exercise with this. Uh, Apparently, the, the ransomware authors were like automating this process, right? The address uh, received a payment, then they uh, automatically put the, the, the key for uh, decrypting the data on the blockchain. So apparently, the ransomware uh, gang were using just like the mempool for searching for this payment, not like directly the blockchain. So the Dutch police uh, found this and uh, put like in one note uh, uh, a payment like of the victim, right? The transaction were broadcasted to other mempools of other nodes until reaching the ransomware gang. And then the police immediately just take out the, the transaction from their mempool, right? So. The only transaction stored in the blockchain was the one of the ransomware gang, and they were able to recover like 155 keys using this procedure, right? Until the ransomware gang realized they were being stealing, uh, stolen. Uh, so we did two techniques for searching more victims of uh, Deadbolt. Um, we wanted to see, um, to compare the coverage of uh, these three techniques. The one of uh, census and Shodan uh, allows us to find 66 payments of victims. Uh, then using the, the key release transactions, just by seeing the, the, the addresses releasing the keys for these 66 uh, addresses found by census and Shodan. Uh, we were able to find uh, 2,400 uh, addresses, right? So uh, a very large increase in the number of victims we can see. 
but uh, within these addresses were only 154 of those recovered by the Dutch police. So we knew that one address was still missing. Uh, so what we did was uh, to take the Operation Oracle and instead of just applying this Oracle to the graph uh, of connected uh, components of this operation, instead we took all the blockchain the last two years, uh, the time frame uh, where Deadpool was alive, and we applied uh, the Oracle to whole transactions there. And uh, then we found the other key release uh, address uh, using this. So we think, because uh, we found all the, the 155 uh, payments recovered by the, by the Dutch police, and uh, because we didn't see any other key release address, we think that we reached like 100% of coverage on the dead ball victims, right? Um, this uh, allows us to do a better estimation of the revenue uh, achieved by, by Deadbolt. And we passed from 2.8 uh, Bitcoins that we saw using Census and Shoda to 98.3 Bitcoins uh, using the Oracle and the blockchain analysis, right? It's a 39 times increase in the coverage, so this uh, allows us like to measure uh, to which extent we are like estimating and analyzing operations and uh, yeah so most probably we are missing most of the operation out there in the wild right you can see in the pictures uh, on the top you have the revenue uh, estimated like by traditional techniques like using census and shodan in the orange line, and the, <clears throat> the, the real estimation on the blue line, right? So this uh, gives you an idea of how uh, low coverage we have while estimating this type of, of operations. And the bottom, you have the daily payments. Uh, so you have like uh, a spike uh, that uh, it's, uh, it happens at the same time than uh, a release of uh, an exploit. That's why it's like most of the, of the transactions are there. Um, so I think that's all uh, from my part. Thanks for your time. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Can this be extended to more um, like privacy coins like Monero or uh, Zcash or? Uh, yeah, so you mean doing like the same analysis on? Yeah, the, so can those also be used for command and control and can they be analyzed? Yeah, okay, so in the case of Monero and Zcash, we have uh, another uh, protocol that it's not based on UTXO like Bitcoin. And um, if I remember correctly, I mean, we don't do this type of analysis because it's not like the same in, than in Bitcoin. But uh, some people do, and it's more like a probabilistic analysis than like deterministic, right? So because you have like um, this different type of transactions that will just uh, pay to a set of addresses at the same time and then do it again and again to like in some way like hide the, the money flow, right? So you have just probabilities of which one is like the most probable to, to be the one you are tracking. But uh, I mean, if I understand it correctly, it's like very hard work. Yeah, we don't do this for now. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, another one over the back, Gibran. Yeah. Hello, uh, I'm Christopher. Uh, let me ask you uh, regarding to the analysis you did. So you got the uh, wallet, uh, so you follow the money from uh, one wallet to another, and you do these graphs. 
can we say that uh, are these uh, wallets belong to one entity? So if, let's suppose, I'm working in law enforcement and uh, I really want to get the, the criminal. Uh, can I cluster all these wallets into one entity? And can I uh, just, just suppose that it uh, belongs to one entity or, or not? Uh, okay. Um, so your, your first question, if I understand it correctly, uh, you're asking if uh, we can say that for sure all these addresses found in the same graph are, uh, mm -hmm. belong to the same entity, right? Okay. This is, um, I mean, this is a very uh, hard question. We think they do, uh, but it's all about the detecting change of ownership, right? So for this, we have some heuristics. So heuristics are not like 100% uh, sure, right? Uh, but in principle, yes, we, we think they are of the same operation. Uh, the thing is that you may have false positives on there, and you also may uh, lose some true positives because of the, the heuristics, right? Uh, for instance, the, the tags are just pieces of information found on the internet, so if I put, uh, hey, this address belongs to Binance, and then I collect this address, and I have no way of verifying this, then I will say that it is uh, Binance, but uh, there is no real proof of that, right? Unless it is Binance who releases all uh, the addresses they use, for instance then we have more confidence on the tax. But if not, then you don't have uh, much confidence. Also, when using the exchange classifier, you have uh, probabilities to, to be right or wrong, right? So we try to approximate the ownership of this, uh, of this operation, but we still uh, don't claim that it's like 100% uh, sure, right? And um, with respect to your second question, uh, we use clustering techniques, clustering heuristics. Uh, we just use uh, multi-input. If you are familiar with clustering heuristics on uh, Bitcoin, we just use uh, multi-input because it's like the most, uh, you, I mean, you, you can trust on, on, on this heuristic more than in any others, like change address detection or shadow address or whatever. Um, we use this because, uh, in principle, the transactions that have multiple inputs on, uh, on, on them need to, to use the, the private key at the same time. So uh, they should belong to the same owner unless it is a special type of transaction called a mixing transaction that we try to avoid while doing this analysis because it will introduce noise. It will uh, mix entities that are not related uh, into the same transaction. So uh, if I understood your question was if we can cluster all these addresses into the same entity, um, we don't do that. We just uh, produce the graph and analyze like the paths in the graph, the the other addresses, or using the oracles. Uh, but we don't cluster them together. For instance, if we want to repeat the analysis to say, hey, all those are of the same entity, uh, just like for like to produce cleaner graphs. Mm. Okay, I appreciate. Thank you. Uh, Gibran, once again, thank you.